Hi, and welcome to this part three of our lesson five video that's all about bench work. A bench work for novice machinists. And today we're going to be looking at taps, dies, and hacksaws. But before we get to that, as often is the case, I found what I was looking for for my last video while I was rummaging through my old drawers to find tools for today's video. And what I had been looking for was a lathe file. So I found one here and I found another one, a regular file of about the same size. So I'm going to put them down here so that we can take a look at what that angular difference on the teeth actually looks like. Now here we have a normal file for bench work and we have an inclination on our rows of teeth of approximately 30 degrees and here we have a lathe file and we see that the teeth are much more inclined. We're looking here at about 60 degree inclination so this file will clear the chips much better. Hacksaws. An important shop tool, especially for the home machinist, because it can be used to cut almost anything. And oftentimes it'll save us a lot of heartache. You know, many times uh, novice machinists tend to cut everything on the mill, even if there's a lot of material to take off. Whereas, you know, 10 minutes work with the hacksaw could have removed a lot of that material and given us a, a secondary part that we could have maybe used for something else instead of just turning it all into chips. Now, there are a lot of similarities between hacksaw blades and files. And a lot of those similarities have to do with chip formation. So let's head over to the whiteboard and take a look at how tooth size and tooth geometry affects chip formation for hacksaws. So, we're back at our whiteboard and I'm recycling this top sketch because basically it's the same cutting principle for hacksaw blades as we did see for files. And if we look here, I'm using the same sketch because the hacksaw blade's tooth has to start at one end and carry that cut throughout the part, as was the case with the files. And that means that if we're cutting a long surface or a long contact between the blade and the part, well, we're going to want to have large teeth. Because we have to store those chips between the teeth for the whole length of that cut. And as was the case with the files, well, if we're sawing soft material, well, we also want large teeth. So, Soft materials and long surfaces, large teeth. If we're cutting very hard materials, well there, just as was the case with the files, we're going to want small teeth. Small teeth for cutting hard materials. And if we're cutting short distances or small surfaces, again, small teeth should be used. Really, the only main difference between the cutting action here of the saw blades and the files is the minimum contact rule and files don't have that rule but saw blades do and here it is when we're sawing apart there has to always be two teeth in contact between obviously the saw blade and the part so i made a sketch this rectangle right here represents my part and i see that i have one two and three teeth so about the same length as the first tooth exits, the third tooth kicks in, and that ensures that I have a minimum of two teeth in contact at all times. And that creates a lot of confusion. I'm not saying that we need, that the part needs to be the same width as the distance between two teeth. I'm saying that we need two teeth in contact at all times. And for that, your distance should be about equivalent to the distance between three teeth, as we can see here. Now, at one point, I may have three teeth in contact, and that's no big problem. But as this one exits, that one enters, and that ensures the minimum two teeth contact, two tooth contact. Now, what's the problem with minimum contact? 
Well, we can see it here. If my part is really a lot thinner than I should be sawing with a blade, the part will fall in between the teeth and it will strike the tooth coming up to it with a lot of force. And that can fracture the end of the tooth. Really a bad situation. Now, once that tooth is fractured, the next one goes and everything goes downhill from there. So this is really to be avoided. The minimum contact rule, very important for hacksawing operations. Another big difference between hacksaw blades and files, well, our tooth set and, and teeth on a hacksaw blade have to be set. What does that mean? Well, they're positioned from side to side on the blade so that the blade can cut a kerf or a groove that's slightly wider than the body of the blade. Now, that is important. Now, set can be different types. Sometimes it's a tooth on one side, tooth on the other, tooth on one side, tooth on the other. Sometimes it's tooth to one side, tooth in the middle, tooth on the other, and in bunches of threes like that. And sometimes it's actual waves where the teeth go as a wave over the length of the blade. The type not too important really for now, but what is important to know is that, that this uh, to set or the width of cut of the blade is crucial because if we didn't cut a groove that was wider than the blade well the blade's body would jam in its own groove and it would be very difficult to cut with. Uh, if we look at the other end of the spectrum well if we had a very wide cut in relation to the thickness and height of the body well, that blade would be difficult to track straight. It would want to move all over the part. So we want some set on the blade, but not too much if we want to cut in straight lines. If, however, we want to cut curves, well, we're going to want a large set and a very short and thin blade so that we can really work around those curves. So the set of a blade is crucial. Now, one last thing about set is that as hacksaw blades wear down, and they do, while well, they wear down on the tips of the teeth, that's the normal wear part, and the blade actually cuts a curve or a groove that's a little thinner as the blades age and wear down. And that's why it's never recommended to put a new blade into a groove that was started with an old one, because it can damage that new blade. Now, since we were just talking about uh, cutting action for hacksaw blades, it would be a good time to mention that the pitch of a hacksaw blade, in, in North America anyways, it comes in number of teeth per inch. So it's not really a pitch, but we call it the pitch anyways. Okay, so number of teeth per inch, and this is really the go-to size for most jobs, and it's the one you see the most often, 18 a teeth per inch. Now, if you went towards a 24 tooth per inch, more teeth in one inch, uh, that would tend to indicate that the teeth are going to be smaller. And if you go to a smaller number, like a 10 teeth per inch, well, the teeth are quite a bit larger. And that is how we select our tooth size by number of teeth per inch. Now, how tooth size are determined in Europe or in metric uh, countries, I wouldn't know. I've always only ever seen a teeth per inch as an indication. So if someone out there can help us understand how the teeth are determined in, uh, in metric countries, well, maybe uh, put a little comment at the bottom of the video here. Now there are four basic types of hacksaw blades. We have uh, solid high carbon steel blades. We have by metal blades, we have precision blades, and we have scrolling blades. Here I have two blades that are, except for the color, very difficult to differentiate. This white one is a solid high carbon steel blade, and this yellow one is a by metal blade. Well, the solid high carbon blade isn't very difficult to describe. It's made of one piece. It's solid high carbon hardened steel. 
It is the least expensive of the two and quite a bit less expensive. Usually this white blade, the high carbon steel one, is reserved for sawing softer materials like very mild steels or brass or, or, or that type of work. Uh, they are, as I said, a lot less expensive, but the geometry and the appearance is identical. They're both 18 teeth per inch. They're both 12 inch blades. They're quite, quite similar. The same width, same height of blade and all that. Now, this yellow one, the one that has the starred colors on it, so I think we know where that one comes from. This yellow one is a bimetal blade, and it doesn't mean it goes both ways. It means that it's a composite blade made of two different types of steel. The teeth, the tooth portion of the blade, the lower portion here, is made of high-speed steel. Okay, so a better quality of steel. And the top of the blade, the body of the blade, is made of a good quality medium carbon steel. And that means that this blade has excellent wear resistance and good flexibility. Because it's a composite, we have the best of both worlds. And this white blade, well, has excellent wear resistance because it's hardened high carbon steel but it doesn't have that flexibility that the bimetal one does and it tends to break a lot more easily. So, least expensive, mostly for softer materials, more expensive for pretty well anything you want to throw at it. The third type of blade that I mentioned, the precision blade, well I don't have an example of. At least I can't find it. But just wait till the next video, maybe I'll find it when I'm looking for the tools for the part 4. But anyhow, I can't find one, but I can still describe it. If we had something that looks like a regular hacksaw blade, but that was about twice the thickness on the body, so a very thick and very rigid body, and that blade would be made of uh, integrally produced in high-speed steel, so a very high-quality steel, and a very thick, and very rigid blade. And the other thing that I've noticed with a, a precision blade is that there would be very little set on the teeth, if any. There's going to be very, very little of a set there. And that means that it is going to cut a groove that is just a few thousandths of an inch wider than its body. Now what do you think that will do? A very rigid tool that has almost no set on the teeth and that has a thick and high body is going to produce a very straight and controllable cut. Thus the name Precision Hacksaw Blade. So if you were cutting surfaces that you wanted to have a better finish and that needed to be quite accurate, well a Precision Hacksaw Blade would be the way to go. Now this is just an example. It's a bimetal because as I said I don't have a precision hacksaw blade on hand. One thing that I should add about those precision blades is that they do cut very straight because they have a very small set on the teeth, but they are quite easy to jam in their own groove. And that means that uh, a coolant or a lubricant should be used, and that also means that a perfect movement needs to be used because we don't want to be uh, putting any torsion on those blades, they're high-speed steel, they break easily, and God knows they are quite expensive. Now, the final type of blade that I wanted to talk about are these scrolling blades that can be installed on hacksaws. The one that I have here is really what I consider to be the best to use for scrolling, and that is an abrasive, uh, carborundum abrasive, uh, wire blade, okay? It's cylindrical in shape and that means that it doesn't need a set because it has no height and no width. It has a width, but I mean that it can do any curve that you want and that's why they're called scrolling blades because they're not at all made for cutting in a straight line. Yeah, it's actually quite difficult to cut in a straight line with them, but if you have to cut curves, this is really the way to go. 
scroll blades. And these abrasive ones can cut almost anything. Ceramics, metals, whatnot. I don't like to use them obviously on softer metals because seeing as they have very little spacing between the teeth, here it's just an abrasive that represents those teeth. Well, they get gummed up quite quickly. But for harder steels or, or steels in general uh, and, and ceramic materials, these work great. Another thing that I should mention is that those precision hacksaw blades that we were talking about, the precision ones, the thick bodied, high speed steel, expensive ones that cut nice straight uh, lines or curves. Well, those blades were often called slotting blades and where I've seen them used way back when a lot was for cutting slots in the heads of screws. So, a little bit of history there. That being said, I think it's important to know that regardless of the hacksawing operation, movement is crucial. And as I explain in the one, two, three, no, sorry, as I explain in the drill point gauge project, uh, it is a lot easier to learn to always cut the same way. You don't want to be cutting, you know, vertically sometimes at an angle, horizontally, all over the place. It's very difficult to master hacksawing and, and to really get good at it. And if we try and do it all willy-nilly at all kinds of angles, well, we're just not going to succeed. So when you are hacksawing, as when you are filing, move the part around and work always in the same plane. Get used to hacksawing vertically only. It is the best position for hacksawing. And if you need to cut an angle, move the part so that your curve for your cut will always be vertical. Now, for technique, this is a theory video. For technique, I'll put some links at the end. I've already put the links to the drill point gauge in sex series or the part one and two of this video on, on bench work. The links were already there, but I'll put the links again to get to the part where you can look at how to hold and manipulate the hacksaw properly. One last question, who's the babe in the background? Uh, some people have mentioned that from other videos. Well, that's my main squeeze, Andre. She's been putting up for me, and I Lord knows why, for the past 32 years, plus several years of courting, uh, and, and she's still around, just a great, great girl, and I'm glad to have her around. So, I hope she sticks around for a good long time. Now, we want to move on to the second part of this video that's all about taps and dies. For very accurate threads or for bizarre thread sizes, well, we're often going to want to use the lathe to produce our external or internal threads. But for most threading uh, jobs or projects, we can use taps and dies, which are really bench work tools. After a quick search in the shop, I came up with this spread of tools that can be used for tapping and threading with dies. So, let's take a closer look. Out in front here, we have our basic straight flute tap set, a taper, a plug, and a bottoming. It's really the workhorse of the tapping world. And we have different types of taps back here. A reduced shank, a fluted or... or uh, reverse tip or fluted tip, uh, a helical flute, uh, no flute or a forming tap, and obviously here with its slight taper we have a pipe tap. Out to the right here we have some die handles, three different types of die handles, and each one is required, and here we have different types of dies. Now they're not different just because they have different sizes, they're different because they're adjusted in different ways. And that is why we need these three different types of handles. Obviously some cutting fluid for tapping or cutting with a die. We have some tap handles here or tap wrenches, uh, standard type here and T handles over here. And we have some tools to help us with tapping and uh, mainly to help us align taps. And we have here 
a spring-loaded center. We have here a drill chuck. Now we don't tap with a drill chuck, but we can use a drill chuck to align our taps properly. And here we have a, a an auto reverse or a reversible tapping head. And this is a really nice tool if you have a lot of tapping to do. Now, before we take a look at each one of these tools in more detail to figure out the where's and the why of's, well, it would be good to head over to the whiteboard and do some calculations because if we're going to tap a hole, produce a thread internally, well, we're going to have to produce that hole first. And what size of hole to produce? Well, our instinct would tend to tell us to look in the machinery handbook and find out what the root diameter of a thread is, its diameter in the bottom of the V, in other words, and drill a hole that size. And that just wouldn't work very well because it gives little clearance to the tool, not very much in other words, and your tap would tend to want to seize up in that hole. We need some room to work in other words. And that means that we drill our tapped holes a little larger than we should. But how much larger? Well, let's go to the whiteboard and find out. Now, to produce an internal thread with a tap, we need to drill a hole beforehand. The question at hand here is, what size of hole? Well, if we think about it logically, if we had a half inch 13 thread to produce in a hole, and I drilled a hole at one half inch, well, the tap would fall through the hole. There would be no material left to cut. So we know that the hole that we have to produce for a half inch 13 thread is going to have to be smaller than a half inch. But how much smaller? Well, a clue could be to say, let's look in the machinery's handbook and find out what the minor diameter or the root diameter of a half inch 13 thread is. And that would give us an exact idea of the smallest diameter on the thread and maybe I should drill the hole that size. Well, if I did, I would have a problem because there'd be very little clearance for the bottom of the teeth on the tap to do their job. And that means that the tap would tend to jam into the hole. Now we need some clearance at the bottom of that V for the tap to be able to cut properly. But how much clearance? Well, in reality, what we want is to cut about 75% of a full thread. And that is really misunderstood. I mean, a lot of people know the 75%, but it does get confusing. So what does that mean? Let's take a look here. So if I look here, I can see that I have the ID with the two first blue lines here. That really is the inside diameter, and that represents the root, the, the, the sharp V root of the thread, okay? And that would be a number that I would get in my machinery's handbook. It would be the smallest diameter of a sharp V thread. Then I have these orange lines here that I call the CID, or corrected inside diameter. And that's what I'm going to want for the tapping. That's the diameter that I'm going to want to drill to pr produce a tapped hole easily. And we see that the orange lines top off just the end of the bottom of those V's because we're looking here at an internal thread. And then we have the OD, which is really the major diameter, but it's the largest diameter. So in the case of our half inch 13 thread, well, the OD would be half inch. Now we know threads are always a little smaller than that, than their OD. Their CID would be, I'm not sure, and their ID would be, I didn't look it up in the handbook to tell you, it's not important, as long as you recognize that we're topping off the root of those threads. And I've drawn it down here so we can get a better idea. Here is a full sharp V thread, right to the tip, the tip. And this is the inside, so the inside hole would be here. I've taken this crest, this root, and I've brought it down here. And we can see here that when I want to cut 75% of a thread, well, I want to remove the first 25%. And that's just this little triangle at the end. It's not 25% of 
the diameter of the thread, it's 25% of the V itself. And that's just the little tip. And we're left with 75% of the thread. Now that little 25% represents a very small portion of the strength of the thread. Now removing it does uh, make the thread a little less strong, but just marginally. We're talking about under 10% of the strength of the thread being in that first 25% of the thread there. Now, how would I calculate that? Well, quite easily. Well, first off, we don't need to calculate it necessarily. We can use one of these uh, table charts, okay, that you can find a little all over the place that will give you what the tab drill size is for a specific uh, sized thread. But seeing as we want to understand, well, let's look at where those numbers come from. And should I ever be stuck without a chart, well, I can still calculate what my tab drill size should be. The formula for calculating my CID, my corrected inside diameter, CID equals OD, so outside diameter, minus the pitch of the thread that we want to cut. So that's pretty straightforward. In our case here, we're going to use a quarter 20 UNC as an example. So one quarter 20 UNC equals, if I apply this formula, to one quarter, a quarter, minus 20, one twentieth. 20 isn't the pitch. 20 is the number of uh, threads per inch. The pitch is a real distance. Threads per inch is a ratio, 20 per one. So if I want to know the distance in one turn of thread, which is the pitch, I'm going to have to say one twentieth. So one quarter minus one twentieth equals 0.2, so 0 0.2 in diameter. And that means that my tab drill size for a quarter 20 thread is going to be 200 thousandths of an inch. Quite straightforward. Now, since UNC Unified National threads are 60 degree V threads, and our basic M series threads in metric are also 60 degree Vs, well, the same formula applies in metric and in imperial because it's a constant based on a thread that has 60 degrees. So let's say I had a thread of M10 by 1.5. That would be the description of my thread in metric. So M10 by 1.5, I apply the same formula, 10 minus 1.5. Now, that's important here. In the imperial, I said 1 20th because the pitch in imperial is given to us as a ratio. I need the distance in one turn. Metric threads, the distance, the pitch is actually in the description. 1.5 here is not 1.5 threads per millimeter. No, it's the, dis it's the distance it takes to make one full revolution on the thread. So it is a real pitch. In other words, there's a thread every 1.5 millimeters here. So I don't have to do one on as I did up here. It's just 10, major diameter, minus 1.5. That means that for tapping an M10 1.5 uh, thread, I'm going to have to drill a hole that's 8.5 millimeters. Okay, so that gives us a good idea where that is coming from. Now, why is it important to understand that? Well, because some materials are more difficult to tap than others. And now we know where the 75% comes from and why it is the way it is. Well, we can sort of figure that if I'm tapping a very soft and easy to cut material, well, I could maybe go with a hole that's a little bit smaller and produce more of a thread. Whereas if I'm cutting a material that's very difficult to tap and my probability of breaking a tap is high, well, I might even make the hole a little bigger, maybe go towards 65% of a full thread instead of 75 with a larger hole and reduce the cutting pressure on the tool. Now, since we understand what we're talking about here, well, it wouldn't be too difficult to figure out what 60% of the thread would be. Now, 60% is 
uh, lopping off a lot of thread. But if you're cutting certain stainless steels that are notoriously difficult to tap, well, that might not be a bad idea. Now, obviously, remember, 60 would be a bare bones basic smallest or biggest hole that you could go at because after that you're getting close to the midpoint of the thread and you're going to be losing phenomenal amounts of strength there. Now if I'm going to be threading a bar or if you prefer producing an external thread I'm going to have to do something similar. I'm going to have to find the proper outside diameter. Now you'll never find a chart that tells you what the outside diameter for threading with a die is. And the main reason isn't because we want a thread to be equal to its nominal diameter. If I'm cutting a half inch thread, the outside diameter is never going to be a half inch. You can't put a half inch male thread into a half inch female thread. It's going to bind. It won't work. The half inch outside diameter or external thread has to be smaller. And most of the time when you're producing a thread with a die, well, it is expected that you know what diameter you want to start with. And for that you need to look it up in the machinery's handbook or in, in a similar type of handbook. So, what diameter is it? Well, if you don't have a handbook and you're not sure, do not just take a half inch bar and start to thread it because your die is going to cut smaller than that and you're probably going to break a tooth off the die. It's not a good situation. You have to start with a diameter that's slightly smaller than a half inch. And for that, like I said, you look up in the machinery's handbook to find the proper outside diameter for the class of thread that you want to cut. Or if it's just a home job that you're approximating, well, use this formula here that I made up years ago. It gives a good approximation. COD, not, not cash on delivery, but corrected outside diameter equals the OD, or the outside diameter nominal, minus the pitch over 7.5. Now remember, the pitch in Imperial is 1 over the number of teeth. So it's 1 over divided by 7.5. Now, if we look at our example, that will give you a reduced diameter that's acceptable for most classes of threads and that is uh, good to help you with your, your cutting with the die. So let's take our quarter, quarter 20 thread as an example. One quarter, my OD, minus 0 0.05, my, my pitch 1 20th is 0.05 divided by 7.5 and that gives me an outside diameter of 243 thousandths of an inch. Now the nominal diameter is 250 so I can see here that I have 7 thousandths of an inch undersize and that means that I'm going to have three and a half thou per side to just give me a bit of clearance so that my die can cut correctly and that this thread will assemble correctly once once everything is done. Okay, it's quite important. Don't just get a 250 thou rod and start threading it. You have to reduce its outside diameter to conform to at least this. And if not, well, look in the handbook to see what it should be. Again, I use constants of 60 degrees to develop this really simple formula. So it applies to both uh, imperial and metric threads, any thread that has a 60 degree V on it. So my M series, M10 by 1.5, for an external thread, I'm going to have 10 minus 1.5, which is my pitch, divided by 7.5, and that gives me a 9.8 millimeter diameter to start with if I want to produce a 10 millimeter nominal thread. So we're past our 30 minute mark by quite a few minutes. And that means that there's going to be a part four to this series on bench work. And who knows, maybe even a part five. And in our part four, well, we're going to start by looking at all of these threading tools for bench work in detail as to why each type exists. And we're also going to be looking at two ways of using a drill press and a drill chuck to help us align our taps when tapping holes. 
and we're going to be looking at this tapping attachment amongst other things. Now, before we move on, as has been the case in the past few videos, I'm going to put up some links here. Now, here's the links to the part one, two, and three of the Drill Point Gauge Project. And if you've been following these videos lately, well, you probably already watched them because it's the same links. But it's interesting stuff and there is some tapping, tapping of small shallow holes in those videos. But I would add to that the part one and the part two, and here's the link, links for those of the one, two, three block project. And I would also add, since we're talking about threading, this link to my little quickie video about threading on the lathe. Now, this isn't about threading on the lathe, it's about threading with taps and dies. But there is in the threading on the lathe video a lot of terminology and a lot of explanations given on threading and threads. So it would be good to take a look at, at that video to get yourself up to speed. Uh, and also, seen as these, this is a series on bench work, I'd like to focus your attention on a crucial part of bench work, and that is attention to detail. And I won't put a link up, but there's a site that I've been watching lately where it's not so much machine work. Although there is good machine work going on here, but it's the attention to detail in the, the work being performed that I find just amazing. And that's Jimmy's Canal. Now, that's Jimmy's Canal is a YouTube site, and it's packed full of his videos that he produces, as most of us do, for the fun of, of sharing. I, I think he comes from Greece, from the clippings I can see when he puts newspaper down to protect surfaces when he's working. But it is amazing to see the attention to detail uh, that this guy puts into what he does. And his videos are really nice to watch. So, Jimmy's Canal, it's not a link. But here's the name and you can find it on YouTube. Well, there you go. So we'll see you in part four of lesson five that's all about bench work. And until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.